In this video, I'm going to talk about the command design pattern. You can use this pattern to represent commands and have control over when they're executed. I'll show you an example of how this works and then also build on top of this example and do something that a lot of non-destructive editors also have, which is nice undo and redo behavior. But first, let's talk about the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creators. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. Skillshare has many classes on web development, programming in Python, software engineering, and software design. At the moment, I'm following Frank Kane's course on data science and machine learning with Python. It's really comprehensive. It contains lessons about statistics, data types, clustering algorithms, decision trees, it covers libraries such as Pandas, basically everything you need to know in order to get started. Skillshare is curated for learning. There are no ads and they're always launching new premium classes. So you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. The command design pattern is a behavioral pattern that provides a way to encapsulate all knowledge about performing a certain operation into a single object. Here's a class diagram. I'll show you how to use it to make transactions in the banking system more flexible and add undo and redo behavior to it. Banks are actually a great example of where you can apply the command pattern since in banks, lots of the interactions are based around transactions or commands. After I've implemented the command pattern and added undo and redo, I'll show you one more thing that really takes the flexibility of this pattern to the next level. Let's dive in. So we have two files here in a banking package. There is an account file and a bank file. It's pretty simple at the moment, an account. It's basically a data class that contains a name, a number, and a balance. We have a deposit and a withdraw method that basically adds and subtracts something from the balance. Uh, withdraw, if the amount you try to withdraw more than there is in the account, then you're going to get a value error, and it simply adds, subtracts it to the balance. Then a bank is basically a class that manages these accounts. So there's a dictionary that contains mappings from account strings, account names to accounts. There's a create account method that gets a name and then creates an account with a random number. There's a get account method that returns an account given the number. And then there's a main file that then uses these two classes to play around with it a little bit. So there's a bank, we create it. We create a couple of accounts. Then account one deposits a uh, hundred thousand cents, so thousand euros, and two and three as well. So we all start with thousand euros. Then Google pays Arian codes 500 euros. And I do that by calling both withdraw and deposit, and that then becomes a transfer. And then, of course, I run away immediately with the money. So I withdraw all the money that I have, and then I leave and go to a nice place in the Bahamas or something. And at the end, I'm going to print the bank. Now, normally, of course, you can't really print a bank. On the other hand, you know, a bank prints money. It's only fair that we should be able to print the bank, right? And then when I run this code, this prints the bank, you see the accounts and I don't have any money on it anymore because I left to the Bahamas. Google has 500 euros and Microsoft still has 100,000 euros. So that's the situation. So at the moment, this code is pretty limited. Uh, we have very little control over when these transactions are executed, what to do when a transaction fails. We can use the command pattern to make this code a lot more flexible. So in a minute, I'm going to change the code and show you how that works. So since the core of the command pattern is that it makes transactions explicit, we're going to need to create as a first step a transaction class. So I'm going to go to the banking package here and then create a transaction file, which will contain that particular class. So that's protocol and it's a class transaction and it's going to have a single method, execute doesn't provide any particular results. And we don't provide an implementation because that's not needed here. So then this becomes our very simple transaction class. So now what we can do is create a couple of common transactions. So I'm going to add another file here called commands, which is going to contain those commands. 
And I'll do three, there's a deposit, a withdrawal, and a transfer. So let's start with the deposit. So let's also make these things a data class, because I think that's quite helpful here. And we're going to have a class deposit. And deposit is going to have an account. And it's going to have an amount that we're going to deposit into that account. I need to fix a few of the imports here. For some reason, this is not importing automatically. I'm not sure why it doesn't do that. And let's also import the account class. There we go. So we have our deposit class that has an account and an amount. Then we are going to implement the method that we need if we want to define a transaction, which is the execute method. Execute. And what that's going to do is self.account.deposit the amount. One thing we probably want to do is print out some status information. So I'm going to add a, a property that just gives me the transfer details so I can use it in various places later on. And let's just create an F string here and that's going to print the amount divided by 100 because we're using integers that represent dollar cents. So like so to account self dot account dot name. So that's our the transfer details. And then here I'm just going to print deposited self dot transfer details. I'm going to create a very similar class for the withdrawal. So I'll just copy this over. Withdrawal. And it also gets an account and an amount just like the deposit. This transfer detail thing, we can leave it. And this is going to be a withdrawal. And then we print out the message as well. And then finally create a transfer class. And this one is going to be a little bit different. It's going to have from account. And this is going to have a to account and an amount. We also want a property here for the transfer details. That's going to provide us with a string. And this is going to be um, an F string that prints the amount from account to account. And then this is what we get. Doesn't entirely fit on the screen, but you get the gist of what this does. And then of course, transfer also needs an execute function. So we first withdraw the money from the from account. And then we're going to deposit that money to the to account. And then let's print out some status information transferred transfer details and probably here I should not call this transfer details that actually doesn't make a lot of sense so um, I should probably call this transaction details and let's do that here as well transaction details and let's do the same thing here there we go so we have a deposit, a withdrawal, and a transfer. These are the basic transactions, the basic commands that we're going to need in a bank. The next thing we'll need is a kind of controller class that allows us to execute these commands. And that controller class then uses the bank to execute the transactions. So I'm going to add another file here called controller. And the controller, let's again make that a data class. I still don't get automatic imports. Not sure why. 
there we go and that's a class bank controller for the moment it doesn't do that much but we're going to expand it in a few minutes so this also has an execute function method sorry that gets a transaction that's of type transaction which we're going to manually import for some reason from banking imports sorry dot transaction imports transaction there we go and then what do we do in this execute function well for now we're just going to execute the transaction at the moment this doesn't make a lot of sense but because later on i'm going to add undo and redo operations you'll see why this is very useful to have a separate controller class like this so that's the bank controller so now let's change the main file to actually use these transactions instead of directly depositing and withdrawing money so we're creating a bank so this we still need to do but what we also need to do is create a controller so create a bank controller so here we do have automatic imports not sure what's happening so we have a bank controller we still need to create a few accounts obviously but now let's use the transactions I'm going to execute a deposit, which is, let's say, to account one, we're going to deposit 100,000 cents. And deposit, okay, deposit, it can import automatically. All right, deposit. And we're also going to need a withdrawal and a transfer because I also want to play around with that. So we have our deposit here of a thousand euros. And then let's copy this a few times. There we go. And then I'm going to make this account two and account three. So that basically replaces these lines. And then we can also do a transfer. We're going to execute a transfer. Let's see, from account two to account one. And with an amount, oh, I just write the amount here. There we go. And then I just delete these. Here it's actually useful to define keyword arguments. So we're sure that account two is the from account and account one is the to account. So we're not accidentally transferring any money to Google. We wouldn't want that to happen, obviously. From account, that's account two. And then we also need to change that here, obviously, to to account. And this is going to be the amount. So now we have a few deposits. We have a transfer. And let's also do a withdrawal just for fun. There we go. And we're still going to print the bank afterwards just because we can. And now let's run this and well, we get the same thing, except now we also have a few of these uh, status messages. So we're depositing money to various accounts, we're transferring money, and we're withdrawing money. I should probably add a dollar sign there. Where is my transfer? Yeah, I forgot that here. Try that one more time. Yeah, that looks much better. I've now built a basic application that uses the command pattern. So we have the transaction protocol class and we have classes that implement that protocol. The next thing I'm going to do is add undo and redo behavior to this example. So let's see how that works. In order to implement undo and redo, we need to extend the transaction protocol to allow for this because at the moment it only has an execute method and we also want to define what undo should do and what redo should do and it makes sense to make this a part of the transaction because at that level we know exactly what we've done so we can also probably hopefully undo it so let's add here two methods an undo method and a redo method which of course we're also not going to provide any implementation here because that's what we'll do in the actual transaction classes so this is step one of what we're going to need. Now, of course, we also need to add undo and redo to our commands that we defined because otherwise they won't implement the protocol correctly. So let's define what undo and redo should do in terms of the deposit. I see I forgot to add 
type pins here. So in case of undoing a deposit, that means we just have to withdraw the money again. And let's also print that we did this. Undid deposit of self self dot transaction details. Let's undo. And let's also implement redo. In this case, redo is actually the same as execute, but still I'm going to write it here explicitly because sometimes you want to do something a bit different in the redo phase because something has changed. So let's add it here again. Deposit that amount. There we go. And let's also print that. Read it. Deposit of the transaction details. There we go. So this is what our deposit class now looks like. I'm going to copy this to the withdraw class and then obviously change it because now it's doing exactly the opposite of what I wanted to do though. So the undo in the case of withdrawal is that we deposit the money again. And the redo means we need to withdraw it. There we go. In case of the transfer the undo and redo is slightly more complicated but not that much i think i missed one more type hint here there we go and in the case of transfer let's add these methods as well so we have a undo method so undo simply means that from the to account we withdraw the money again and the from account we deposit it there we go. Let's also print out a status message. Undit transfer transaction details and redo. So you could maybe simplify this and just say redo is just execute and undo is the other way around. I just split it here because I think it might be useful in some cases. So here, this is again, it's the same thing amounts which we withdraw and then to the to account we deposit it and let's print the status okay so now we defined what should happen if we undo a command a transaction and what should happen when we redo a transaction what we still need to fix now is have some way of managing undos and redos and that's where the bank controller class comes into play. Because instead of just executing a transaction, the responsibility of the bank controller is to keep track of this undo redo list so that it can basically roll back those transactions and go to a previous state. So that means in case of the bank controller, we're going to need two lists to keep track of this. One is the undo stack which is a list of transactions. And I'll use the default factory for this, which is a list and field I need to automatically import. There we go. And we are also going to need a redo stack. And we need to keep track of these two lists because we need to know what we should do when we undo something or what we should do when we redo something so we have undo and redo stack and now that means that when we execute a transaction we're going to need to update these two stacks with the right information the first thing we need to do is when you execute a new transaction it means the redo stack gets cleared because you can't redo things from the past after you've done a new transaction so we'll say the redo stack dot clear so it gets reset to an empty stack basically and then what we do is the self dot undo stack we're going to append the transaction so we can undo it then what i'm going to do is add an undo method to the bank control that just undoes the last transaction undo the type is going to be none I should probably also add that here. There we go. If there is nothing in the undo stack, 
we can't do anything here. So I'll just add an if statement here to cover that case. Then the first step is that we're going to need to get the last transaction that we executed and undo that transaction. So the last one we can get using the pop method. So let's say we have a transaction a variable and that's the self dot undo stack dot pop. What's nice about pop is that it also now removes it from the undo stack, which is great because we're going to undo this transaction. So it no longer should be in the undo stack. So take the last element, remove it, and then we have our transaction and we're going to undo this transaction. Transaction dot undo. In order to allow for redo behavior, we should also add it now to the redo stack. So we can redo anything that we've just undone. So let's add the transaction there. So this is what undo does. The redo method does something similar. Redo. If there is no redo stack, we simply return because we can't do anything. Then we're going to get the last transaction from the redo stack using exactly the same pop method so that again removes it from the redo stack and then we execute the transaction by calling redo and then finally we add the transaction to the undo stack so now we have in the controller our execute our undo and our redo now before i continue let's just verify that this still works correctly so i'm still printing the bank and getting all the information here. But now let's say I want to undo my withdrawal at the end. So you see currently, if I print the bank, my balance is zero. But if I add one line here and say controller dot undo, new do, undo, there we go. And let's run this code. Now you see my balance is back to 1500 euros. You can play around with this. Uh, let's, let's say I'm going to undo deposit to the Microsoft account. So then you see Microsoft doesn't have any money. And then let's redo this. And then you see we are back at the full balance because it redid the transaction again. If I call redo one more time, actually nothing is going to happen because there is nothing in the redo stack anymore, as you can see. So it's, it doesn't have any effect here. You could change this to actually raise an error or something if you wanted to. But the idea is the same. We now have a pretty neat system where we can deal with transactions and undo and redo them. Because a command or transaction is now a thing, we can make it even more flexible by adding groups or batches of commands that seamlessly integrate into this system. So let's see how that works. So let's create one more type of command, which is a batch, which basically accepts a list of commands. So I'm going to add it here to the commands file. So that's also a data class. So it's a batch. It has a list of commands this time. So using the default factory here of list. That's a transaction and that's the field. There we go. So batch keeps track of a list of commands and then we also have an execute method because obviously it needs to implement the protocol when you execute a list of commands i'd like to roll back to the previous state before we started executing the batch basically so that means i need to put my execute calls on the commands in the list in a try accept block so i can catch any uh, value errors that occur so what I'm going to do in order to be able to roll back is keep track of the commands that have successfully completed. So I'll make a variable here called completed commands, which is also a list of transaction. Initially it is empty. There we go. And then create a try accept block. And in that block, I'm just gonna go through each of these commands. And I'm going to call execute on the command. There we go. And then I'll add the command to the completed commands list. If you have an exception, 
So let's say we want to deal with value error. You could add multiple types of exceptions here if you wanted to, but I'll just deal with value errors here. Then we're going to have to undo the commands that were already completed. And because we have to do undo, we have to go back in time. Basically, we have to start at the end of the list and then go back to the front and do them again in that order. So I need to reverse my completed commands list. And I'm going to call undo on each of these commands. So that's our execute function. So that's the execute method. I also need to add to the batch an undo and a redo method. So if I'm undoing the commands, I need to do the same thing, basically what I did here with the completed commands, but now I need to do it with all the commands. So I also need the reversed list or that's actually not a list what you get, but an iterator. And that's going to get the self.command. So that's going to iterate through the command list in a from back to front. And then I'm going to call command.undo. And redo is the same thing. And here I'm assuming that undo and redo, because we did those operations before, I'm not going to raise an error. I mean, it's it's a big assumption. That's probably not a very smart idea. You probably want to also add exceptions here, but it becomes complicated very quickly because what do you do when an undo fails? You need to undo the undo. And probably at that point, you want to send a mail to a bank operator and ask what you should do now because it's not clear anymore. I see I have an error here. That's because I wrote the name wrong. And then here, I'm also going to go through the list. So for redoing things, I don't need to reverse the list. So we're redoing the command. So again, you might simplify this example by just assuming that redo does the same thing as execute. So now we have the batch class. We can start using it in the main function. So let's say I have here my initial deposit of a thousand euros to the Arium codes account. What I could do now is also execute a batch of commands. So this is going to get a batch where I'm going to define what the list of commands is. So that's a list of a couple of things. So let's say I want to move these things into a batch. So I'll deposit all this money and then I'll also do this transfer here. I should add a comma here like so. And then I can remove this. So now I've created a batch of commands and let me run this and see if this works as intended. So I didn't remove this transfer. I should probably do that. And these ones I can remove as well. So now we get the same behavior as before I added the batch. So yeah, that looks good. We have the uh, withdrawal. I undid the redrawal actually. And these Google and Microsoft balances also seem correct. So the funny thing is, that let me put this into comments. If I run this now, so we have the batch. So actually now the only thing that happens was uh, depositing this money and transferring it from the second account to the first account. So then we get this state, but I can now do an undo and that's actually going to undo the entire batch. So you see now I have my original money again, uh, Google and Microsoft have zero, which is as it should be. Uh, but you see undo basically does undoes the entire batch. And of course, what's cool is that batch is a command. So you can create a batch containing other batches of commands, etc., etc. And that really shows the flexibility of the command pattern because a command is now a thing that you can store, that you can organize, structure in some way. You can even create a system where the, the time and date that these batches are executed is not immediate, they're planned. And then, for example, you could prepare a whole batch of transactions that you're going to do as a bag and then execute them at night when all your servers are not so busy with the day-to-day -day operations of your bank. So that's just one of the nice things you can do with the command pattern. And let's also check that rolling back works. So now I undid it and basically what we end up with is that my original balance is a thousand euros. Let's comment this out. And now let's say I try to withdraw from account three, 
which is the Microsoft account, I'm going to withdraw a ridiculous amount that doesn't exist on that account. The balance is not there. So this is going to raise a value error. And then what's going to happen is it's going to roll back these deposits as well, because it's going to roll back the entire batch. So let's try this. So now you see we have the original deposit to my account, but Google, both Microsoft are zero, which is what we like. This transfer has also not been executed because the withdrawal here resulted in an error and then it undid these things. So you can see it actually undid these things here because the error happened. It might be helpful to actually print the error when there isn't such an exception. So let's do that. Let's say we're going to print command error and then we're just going to print the value error. There we go as E and then this is going to be E. There we go. And now if I run the main function one more time, oh, there's something wrong here. Wait, let's try that again. So now you see we get a command error, insufficient funds. As you can see, the command pattern is quite powerful. You can use it to model transactions in a banking system like I did in this example. But this pattern is also used in a lot of non-destructive editing programs like video or audio editors. What I didn't really talk about in this video is that next to storing the state is that you can also store the transaction history. Of course, you want to know what has been withdrawn and deposited onto your bank account, right? But there's also some redundancy there because if you know the history of transactions, you can basically reconstruct the balance that's on your account. So then the question rises, what is the ground truth? Is the truth, is that the balance on your account? or is the truth the history of transactions? In the example that I've shown today, clearly the balance is the ground truth because we don't store the list of transactions. Next week, I'm going to revisit this pattern and then I'll switch the implementation to use transactions as the ground truth and not the state and see how that affects the design of the system. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a like and consider subscribing to my channel if you wanna watch more of my content. Thanks for watching. Take care and I hope to see you next week for part two.